So, uh, Preachers, we uh, know that this has been a busy season for you, and we are so grateful uh, that you have uh, stayed with us and that you have been faithful in the communities where you have a sphere of influence. And we just want to thank you for the work that you do. We really think that good preaching changes lives. In some cases, it saves lives. And so we're grateful uh, that you're making the extra effort uh, during this season to, to preach well, to preach faithfully, uh, and to preach honestly. And now that you go into Holy Week, know that you are held with the love that Jesus talks about on that last night of his life, of love one another as I have loved you, that God holds you in that love, Jesus holds you in that love. And we are so grateful that you preach that love uh, to the people who need to hear it. So thank you for your thank you for your preaching and know that you are held this week as you anticipate the resurrection in love. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. Today we are celebrating the readings for Good Friday, April 15th, 2022. The first reading is Isaiah chapter uh, 52, verses 13 through chapter 53, verse 12. Um, the psalm is the 22nd psalm. The second reading is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 through 25. And the gospel is in John chapter 18, uh, beginning with verse 1 and reading through chapter 19, verse 42. Now, this is Good Friday, and so we've got uh, some long readings, and various people will find various uh, traditional ways of celebrating, and uh, some will do uh, seven last words, uh, um, and we're uh, going to uh, just uh, start with uh, taking a look at what we might do if we were to focus on somewhere in those two chapters of the Gospel of John. Who wants to start? I'm willing to start. Okay. We haven't shared what each one is, so there's the risk that somebody else will take Ooh, mine. So I don't, take mine. don't take mine. Don't take I, mine. Don't take mine. Try not to. Uh, actually, what's really speaking to me this year is Isaiah 52 to 53, but uh, we'll get to that. But John, for me, it would be the, uh, the conclusion of the trial of Jesus before Pilate, and that that... I, I think you need to have a sense of drama here if you're preaching on this. Uh, Pilate has gone back and forth between the Jewish leadership and Jesus. He has uh, tried to talk Jesus into things. He's negotiated in some ways with the leadership. He has even tried um, he has even tried uh, inquisitional torture to get Jesus to confess something. And now he brings Jesus out, uh, sits on the stone pavement, and we're told it's about noon. I mean, the narrative slows down. And you get a sense of the of the the layout of the scene and the timing. And he says to the Jewish leadership, "Here's your king, the guy I've just beaten to a pulp. Right? Here's your king. This is the kind of king that Jews deserve. I think is partly what the tone of voice uh, that Pilate probably has here. I think Pilate is milking this scene. Um, they cry out, away with him, away with him, crucifying. Right." disavowing him, right? Not our king. Pilate says to them, shall I crucify your king? I mean, see what's going on here, right? He's getting them not just to say, to separate from Jesus, but to separate themselves from kingship uh, in general, because later on, they're going to reject to the idea that he calls himself king, right? They're going to ask that the signage be changed uh, as well. The chief priests answered, we have no king but the emperor, which is just a chilling thing for them to say at noontime mm -hmm. uh, for the Jewish leadership, right? The people who, who run the temple, who basically hold in trust so much, uh, not just in terms of religious fidelity to God, but in terms of just the nationalistic hope. Nationalistic is the wrong word to use. Let me just say kind of the sense of Jewish autonomy and nationhood. Nationalistic is, means a whole lot of things in our, in our world right now. That at that moment, they essentially utter a blasphemous claim um, because that's the price it's going to take to get rid of Jesus. And Pilate must be delighted, right? Mm -hmm. Because what he's gotten them to do is say, 
um, there is no such thing as Jewish kingship or Jewish kingship rightly gets you crucified in this system. Uh, they know the price and it's this, um, I've hardly mentioned Jesus, of course, it's the end of the, of the, of the end of the road for him, right? From this point forward, he's now going to be more or less processed as a, as a criminal if he hasn't been already. But it's this moment of, um, of, of otherwise hopefully well-meaning religious people uh, falling prey to the traps of power, um, of making an alliance that is going to cost them dearly with a guy who's really a monster. I think that's Pilate. Um, no offense to friends of Pilate out there. Mm -hmm. um, Pilate's no friend to the Jews or the Jewish cause. We know this from other literature. It's just this scene that I think makes us remember um, not just our, our desire to keep our own distance and our own kind of autonomy from God, but to make alliances with any kind of forms of power that will help us do that better. Um, and the way that the church is always enticed by that kind of influence and that kind of role and the way in which as much as we might say we don't want to do this, we're enticed by the ways of the world that 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 know how to use power much better than we do. So it's that scene for me. Why is that particularly appropriate for 2022? Oh, I don't know. You can guess maybe, or you can think about that or not. But it's 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 what a vulnerable church does. It's what religious people do when we get scared and we think that our message isn't good enough or our communities aren't strong enough. Uh, or the, the surrounding marketplace of religious ideas is too competitive and we don't have a good enough message that we fall back on that. We talked a lot for Monday Thursday about love and the power of love. We just, we don't trust that, <laughs> right? Earlier in John, when Jesus says, if you love one another, that's how you'll know everybody. That everybody will know you're my disciples. I don't think we ultimately believe that promise. And I think this is a good scene that reminds us of that in its own, if you followed my logic there. So, that's my, thanks for coming to my TED Talk for my Good Friday sermon. I'm ready to take an offering now. Ed. How about you two? I'm eager to hear what you think. Um, I'm trying to uh, renegotiate where, where I was and I'm gonna piggyback where you are. I finally have been watching Agents of the Shield um, and uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm a Marvel Universe geek, um, and uh, uh, it it that where you are struck me as well uh, because uh, I was uh, recently listening to a podcast about our prison system, and uh, it, it this text reminds me of how more than compromise, um, merging church and state executes God's righteousness in the name of justice. And I'm, I'm trying to say that slowly so you can hear the play on words that I'm doing. Merging church and state executes God's righteousness in the name of justice, where, where we are, are not getting justice or God's righteousness because it's more than a compromise. We're actually destroying it. We're actually killing it. And, and Agents of the Shield uh, is just this back and forth um, where you don't know who to trust, you, you the, the story is going somewhere, and then it backs up over and over again. And um, at the very beginning of, of uh, chapter 18, um, we have this place um, uh, uh, that was a garden, which takes us all the way back to the beginning of John's gospel, as it echoes the beginning of the uh, Jewish scripture in the beginning God. And what does God do? God creates a garden, a space. And, and now we're overwhelmed with uh, all of the glamor and glitz of the city. And we've lost the intimacy uh, and the life that um, is 
just hanging around, getting your hands dirty in a garden to, to, to work with creation, to bring forth life. And that, that, that circular reasoning, that, that narrative repetition that brings us all the way back to the same story we've already been telling is for me what John does here. Just the way that this is told uh, exposes that it's a hindsight description rather than a prescription. This is um, uh, a story that is told because the, the, the readers, the listeners have the scriptural imagination of, of ancient Jewish practices. And everything that is happening here is, as you've already pointed out, Matt, Matt a, an assault against what it means to be this peculiar people um, when in actuality, the promise of God's reign is an assault on everything on the fallen creation. And somewhere in the midst of that, just starting off in this garden story, not being seduced by the glitz and glamour of power in, in the city, and to participate with God in uh, a countercultural way of bringing about a healing of the earth, salvation. Um, I'm gonna use your words in the same way. If you followed that circular reasoning that I was doing there, uh, the opening of, of chapter 18 does what you pointed out uh, later in the reading, I think. Well, I, 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 I... I'm probably, I shouldn't, well, okay, I have two, kind of, <laughs> but, uh, but the, the first is, uh, it's kind of drawing a little bit on my comments with regard to Monday, Thursday of where we should be, and the, the drama of Monday, Thursday, and John of putting us around that table and looking at one another and saying, is it going to be you? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be me who's going to betray Jesus? And, and, and what that means in John, it means an abandoning, abandoning the relationship. It means, it means rejecting the relationship. It doesn't mean handing Jesus over because Jesus does that himself. And, uh, and, and if we carry that forward into the passion narrative, uh, it, it, it we're, we're given these in John, we're given these characters who, who's there and who's not. Uh, and, and so uniquely to John at the foot of the cross, you have the mother of Jesus and we haven't seen her since, since uh, Cana. And then the beloved disciple, uh, um, which again, I think puts us there, that that's where we're standing and what, what are we seeing? Uh, what are we hearing in Jesus saying, behold your mother, behold your son. Then you also have going forward in the, in the passion narrative of, of Jesus burial, and you have Nicodemus coming back. And so it, it's, a, it's a narrative that invites us into these, these places or this, this space of where, where will we be? Will we be at the foot of the cross? Will we be at the burial when, uh, you know, nobody's paying attention? <laughs> well, uh, and then you've got Peter. So it's actually one thing. I thought it was two, but I think I'm going to connect Peter in this way. Okay, so talk about the circular. Okay, follow me. Here I go. So that Pete, because Peter's denial is so different here than in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and Peter's denial here, the question to Peter is, are you one of his disciples? Where in Matthew, Mark, and Luke is, do you know the man? Don't know him. Do you know him? Don't know him. Here, are you one of his disciples? I am not. That's not a that's not an accident, right? So, so Peter, where is Peter? The question of, are you one of his disciples? I am not. Are you going to be at the foot of the cross? Are you are you with with the mother and Mary Magdalene and the beloved disciple? Is are you going to be Nicodemus, this character we haven't seen since chapter seven? And so, uh, so maybe not one, not one place that you that you invite people to imagine, but like, where are you in this narrative? Uh, have you already have you already said I am not? 
Uh, are you there at the cross? Are you, have you skipped the crucifixion and going to the burial coming in at the end uh, uh, and trying to show G your love for Jesus then? Uh, I, that's kind of where I am um, this time around, of that, of paying attention to these unique characters in this story and, uh, and where is it that they get located and then where, where do you see yourself and being really honest with, uh, if you were asked, could you say, I am one of his disciples? Um, could you make it to the foot of the cross or, or would you, would you be with Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea um, asking for Jesus' body? And, and um, reflecting on I love, that. Yeah, I, I love that, that finding the different places. One of the things that uh, I uh, was reminded of is that um, there's a difference between uh, self-preservation that becomes our most intentional um, act. And uh, I, I don't think Peter intended to deny Jesus. Um, but that moment of self preservation took over. And uh, uh, we're constantly there, particularly in our culture right now. Um, and I know Matt wants to talk about Isaiah 52. And I'm going to kind of slide us over in there. Uh, to, to, to recognize that Jesus doesn't look anything, at, particular at this moment, Jesus doesn't look anything like the Savior. He doesn't look like, you know, this isn't the person that's got my back. This isn't the person that is winning. This isn't the person who's doing the triumphal in entry. At, at this moment, um, this is the scariest moment, the loneliest moment. And uh, it, it's when we really need to question ourselves. What does, uh, what does the servant of God look like? And what are we, what are we, who are we following? Uh, are we following the one who looks like power and prestige and prosperity? Or are we following the one who will reconcile um, those who uh, have become enemies? Yeah, um, that's the question. And I think it's, it's a nice segue into Isaiah, if we can do that. Sorry, my, my dog just woke up from a, a long spring nap. Um, but um, he has loved the pandemic, by the way. Uh, Isaiah, so it's, yeah, I don't know what catches my attention about this text. I think as a New Testament scholar, I spend most of my time worried about making sure people don't run too quickly to Isaiah to interpret the New Testament, right? That I, I point out, there are some New Testament authors who deliberately refer to this part of Isaiah. There are some who do not, and you might be surprised that they don't. And, but, you know, when you open yourself up and you read it and you think it's just a horrific description of human suffering. And in some ways of God's own responsibility for that or vindication of that but also permission of that and uh, you know which is requires a lot of discussion and nuance but it's also a discussion or, or in part a description of how how folks respond to human misery and in, in others and just how utterly distasteful it is and so it it just has me thinking about the crucifixion for example which you know was done publicly for a, a reason uh, people probably came out to watch them, just like people who have come out to watch public executions in um, throughout history, uh, whether judicial or extrajudicial, um, for whatever reason, it, whatever kind of human need that or itch that scratches. In Luke's gospel, we know people come out to watch and some just to lament, uh, others to hurl insults. Yeah, it's just there's something about the scene that just catches my attention this year. There's my dog. That catches my attention this year about the, um, what does the crucifixion say about us? And what does the public nature of the crucifixion say about us as human beings? And that part of the job of, of a preacher is not, is to, is, to, is to tug at that impulse that so many of us have, which is, 
well, that wouldn't have been me, or I wouldn't have stood idly by, or I never would have given any consent to that whatsoever. And just to kind of say, well, maybe we do. And there's some kind of complicity that human society holds in general. That's more than just about the blood and the pain of crucifixion, but is about the entire spectacle and the way in which we try to hold society together, excusing the suffering of some um, in order to, uh, to protect the rest of us from having to experience that, which is, you know, I haven't said anything that nobody's ever thought of before, or that people, everything I've said, somebody else has already said before and thought of, but I don't know why that resonates with me this year in particular is just such a, a poignant um, emotion or something to explore on, on Good Friday this year. Maybe you can help me figure out why it's why it speaks to me in a different way this year, more loudly this year than other years. Well, I think I, uh, when what I hear in that too, Matt, is uh, actually um, take us back to John for a minute. I uh, in John's uh, for Jesus, John's last word is "It is finished," and that can sound really triumphant. I, uh, and yeah, if it's mis if it's misunderstood, it can sound like, uh, particularly if it's gets doctrinally laden with that, with Jesus suffering as, as a moment of salvation and that the cross is, 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 is the ultimate, um, is the ultimate act of God's love and Jesus love, uh, which it isn't in John. Uh, and, but but what it got me thinking about what you were talking about is the way in which, you know, it is finished is it can be translated. It has been brought to completion or uh, it is it, it's reached its intended goal or it has been performed. It's the teleo telos. And and what really is behind that is is the the fullness of the incarnation and the entirety of what the inc the entirety of what Jesus had to bear as being incarnated which has now culminated in this horrific death but it's been all along um, uh, dealing with and navigating the human condition in all of its uh, <clears throat> horrifying realities of betrayal, of denial, of of um, of everything, right? And that uh, and and that to what extent this is a that Jesus' last words are a commentary on that, uh, uh, the commentary of the of entering into fully uh, <clears throat> the the underbelly of humanity. Uh, and that that comes to completion here uh, in his death, and yet it's a perfect tense. So there's something more. Something's going to, uh, and that and that Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Uh, the verb there is handed over. Like no, everybody tries to hand him over, but no, Jesus does it himself. And so uh, there's a, that a, a holding that. You know that other depravity and that other, you know, um, the 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 entirety of our responses and how how we would, what do we think we would do? And yet, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, uh, Jesus hands up his spirit so as to give it to us. <laughs> yeah, that's because that's what's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. That your description, Caroline, um, and 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 Matt, I think this is a perfect segue to lead us through here. Um, why is this what's on your mind right now? Because that's what we're living in right now. We're living in a culture of contempt. We're living uh, uh, where we are still making a spectacle of others suffering, whether uh, that's uh, what makes it on the evening news or what um, gets the most hits on uh, our Facebook feeds or our YouTube videos. We're, we're still making a spectacle of suffering. We're, we're um, um, we're still um, um, participating in what brings poverty to uh, a, a large segment of, of society. We're, we're still um, 
the, the, what was the word you used, Caroline? We're still the underbelly of, of all of, of, of human behavior. And uh, it makes me want to look at the 22nd Psalm differently. Um, uh, I like to stop on the why. My God, my God, why? Um, have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why? Are you so far from helping me? My God, my God, why? Um, are you so far from the words of my groaning? That just seems to be the society we're living in, the culture, the experience of so many people that um, is the church able to linger uh, on the cross? Are we willing to look at Jesus? Are we willing to be here and not rush uh, to Easter Sunday, but to pause and, and lament, to pause in the pain, um, to, um, to not be seduced by the, um, the entertainment of the suffering, but to actually feel what our actions, uh, what it means that our that we are participating in what, what creates this suffering for others because we're willing to watch, uh, because we're willing to remain silent. And so that it is those who are suffering, not us, but it is those who are suffering that are repeating the words of Jesus, that are repeating the words of the psalmist. Where's the good news? Where is your God? God, why? Um, I, I, I just, I want Good Friday. Uh, uh, Emerson says in his commentary, there was nothing good about Good Friday at this moment. Uh, and and, and I, I, I just, I think in order for us to fully experience Easter Sunday, we have to linger in at the cross. Well, of course, the psalm helps us do that. It, it, it seems an odd mix when you're reading John, because I think people will know that this is the psalm Jesus recites in, in Mark and in Matthew. Mark. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, it's another great text, I think, that goes with the Isaiah text really poignantly. Should we say anything uh, briefly about Hebrews? <laughs> Sorry. Anybody who's watching the video on YouTube can see the... It was less than perfect enthusiasm on your faces, but uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, the verse that I would tie in, um, and this would go all the way back to when we were, uh, when Caroline was talking about John and finding our place uh, in in uh, among the characters uh, uh, in in the scene rehearsed in John, and that would be a uh, 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 verse twenty three. Uh, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering um, and uh, just this sort of sense of uh, if the promises of Christ, of God made known in Christ are faithful, will we be among those who will hold through the crucifixion, will hold through uh, the death, will hold through the burial, that will hold on to the promise even when it looks like the promise has been executed? Well, I think to be fair, my answer to that is no for myself. <laughs> but, but this is where, this is where the, the fact that Hebrews is addressed to a community helps me. Yep. You know what I mean? What you just said, like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. I mean, it sounds good, but I, I don't trust myself to hold on to that confidence. But I do want to be part of a community that carries me through it when it's hard for me to do so. And, and where I can pitch in as well. So, which is why I like the, you know, that line about not neglecting to meet together, which is a verse that's been beat up over the last two years of people quoting this to somehow insist that, you know, you won't get sick if you hold a church service during a pandemic. But it's, but the point there is this, uh, this reaffirmation, this reminder of power of a community to hold fast this confession or to hold each other back as well. And so, again the, the communal aspect of our life together in christ and, and i love the line that we do that in order to provoke one another to love and good deeds 
What does it mean to, in the midst of all that we're being challenged to do, to for our provocative radical action is to provoke others to love and good.